You're here to learn how ARCX can help you prepare for a strong financial future to be able to provide abundantly for your family, friends, and loved ones. So let's dive right in. Today, ARCX launched their new Space Exploration ETF, and we saw that it didn't exactly take off to Mars like many expected. Joining ARC's seven other ETFs, the stock fluctuated between $20 and $20.70. Oh, what drama. We did see markets on the whole much more relaxed today than on Monday after we saw a lot of drama with the Suez Canal ship blockage collapse thing going on. And also the collapse of Archegos, the hedge fund that over leveraged and blew itself up. Generally speaking, the market was like pretty calm. So today I wanted to take a first look at ARCX, what's special about them, where they're hoping to go in the future. Then I wanted to share some of my thoughts on their positions, uh, how things could go potentially in the coming years and the potential possibilities. If you're new to my channel, welcome. My name's Trey. I'm a Canadian American entrepreneur living in Japan for the last 10 years. One of my claims to fame is that I took 200 bucks and turned it into $1 million in revenues uh, with one of our companies here. And I'm a long-term investor. I've been in the market for probably 12 years. Um, I love tech. Uh, I love oversold and beaten down stocks. And I also love sushi. But before we look at ARCX and their holdings, I wanted to mention SpaceX. It's pretty safe to consider SpaceX to be the biggest game changer in the space industry. Started by Elon Musk with the primary goal of eventually getting humanity to Mars, within his own lifetime, SpaceX has brought the price of satellite launches down drastically and is also bringing mind-shattering technology to things like landing friggin' spacecraft again and reusing them. Like, nobody's done that before. And we're seeing companies like NASA, who've typically always dominated the space, kind of panicking and, and being like, oh my gosh, how are we going to keep up? How can we compete with this? Check it out. Here we have a shart. Shart. <laughs> I keep doing that. <laughs> Check it out. Here we have a chart showing the cost per kilogram to get packages into low Earth orbit. Check it out here on the left. 2016's Atlas V it says $14,000 per kilogram of payload. And then it goes down 2014's Ariane 5. And then 2020's reusable Falcon 9. And then on the right there, future reusable Starship at like a thousand bucks per kilogram or less. Keep in mind that the 2016 Atlas V was intended to get the Perseverance rover to Mars. So it's a little bit like not comparing apples to apples. Whereas other spacecraft that are trying to get satellites into low earth orbit would probably be a lot cheaper like by default. So it's not really apples to apples here. But this is a quick brush stroke for you to paint a picture of how rapidly things are heating up on the space tech frontier. Continuing on that string of thought, check out this forecast of scheduled satellite launches on the horizon. Check it out here going on the left from 2005 all the way up to 2020. There's like a few thousand satellites scheduled for orbit, but it says planned in the future more than 25,000 plus launches. So as the price of rockets gets cheaper because they're becoming reusable and technology is just improving overall so they can get up and come back much quicker, we're also going to see the number of satellites people are sending up uh, booming going forward. And all of this is possible because of companies like SpaceX. And all of this is possible because of companies like SpaceX basically breaking the industry apart, bringing in new technologies that have been previously considered impossible. So let's stop there with the SpaceX talk and let's take a brief look at the holdings in the ARCX fund. Um, we'll look at some of the potential going forward after that. They've broken down the fund as a whole really nicely for us in the prospectus here. So let's take a look section by section. First of all, we have the technology element breakdown with orbital aerospace, suborbital aerospace, enabling technology and aerospace beneficiaries. And here's the sector breakdown explaining a bit more about what the technology elements are split into. We have communication services, consumer discretionary, industrials, information technology, and not classified. So we have a surprising mix for those who are expecting primarily like asteroid mining and alien defense technologies. 
I'm not sure if enabling technologies refers to technologies that enable space innovation or technologies that make enough money to keep this fund afloat while it's in its infancy. As we'll see some decidedly non-spacey stocks in the fund here in a minute when we dive in deeper. Here's a breakdown of the market caps of the companies in the fund, as well as associated geographies. Not surprisingly, it's very heavily weighted to mega and large cap companies in North America, with a sprinkling of some others. Next, we have a broad list of the current 38 holdings in the fund, and we'll take a quick look over some of them. Many of these names you may be familiar with, and some of them you're probably going to be confused about. We start with the largest holding, Trimble, which is a $19 billion market cap company from Silicon Valley, which was started in the 70s. Because this company is the number one holding, I wouldn't be surprised if we see an explosion of interest in this company as more and more people start to explore the contents of the ARKX fund. Simply put, Trimble appears to be a tech company that works to improve productivity, quality, safety, and stability in their partner companies through various different industries, including agriculture, uh, geospatial, all kinds of engineering, telecommunications, and a lot more. It looks like they're also world leading when it comes to location-based technologies and could not only support uh, the efforts in location-based technologies, but could also benefit greatly from having more satellites up in space. They actually do have very strong conservative fundamentals, so I wouldn't consider this a speculative play by any stretch of the imagination. Second up, we have Print, ARC's very own 3D printing fund. I think they found the infinity money loop glitch, guys. This makes up 6% of the fund and is itself a $132 million fund made up of 55 holdings itself. Since my brain's starting to grasp kind of how world-changing 3D printing technology is going to be in the future, I also started to look more into the industry and made my first video on a company called Desktop Metal, uh, the 17th holding in that PRNT fund, who at the moment I think has the record for the fastest 3D printing technology and the fastest 3D printing systems. If I'm wrong or if you know otherwise, please let me know down in the comments section. Please click up here if you'd like to learn more about desktop metal. It's worth noting that Trimble is also on the print ETF at number seven or 4.7% of the fund as of filming right now. Speaking of infinity money glitches, Going back on down the ARCX list, we start to see various other selections like Kratos Defense and Security, known for tactical jet power drones, as well as similar companies like L3 Harris Technologies, who would probably be known more for actual new machinery and defense type offerings. Going on, we see traditional defense contractors and aerospace plays like Lockheed Martin at number seven and Boeing at number 10, with Airbus at number 23. But we also have traditional heavy machinery companies like Japan's Komatsu at number six and Deer at number 13, who make you know heavy machinery and lawnmowers and stuff like that. I always think of ride-on lawnmowers when I think of John Deere. Don't know why. ARC's probably not super interested in getting ride-on lawnmowers to the moon, um, but let me know if you think otherwise. <laughs> AI and processing plays like NVIDIA at number 11, uh, Alphabet or Google at number 16, with Taiwan Semiconductor, one of the world's greatest, at number 31. Uh, if you don't know about Taiwan Semiconductor, apparently they're like the one... If you've heard about the uh, semiconductor shortage going on in the world right now, Taiwan Semiconductor is basically like thriving off of that whole shortage going on right now. We do also see some seemingly unbefitting selections like Amazon at number 14, Alibaba at number 22, and Netflix at number 26. Without spending too much time digging into each company more specifically, there's one more thing I could think of that's missing from this portfolio. And it's just like, it needs to be here, guys. ARC's initial kind of sales presentation for ARC X from a few months ago goes on to talk about how satellite broadband revenues are going to be blowing up in the coming years. Check it out here. They have on the right 42 million Americans without access to broadband. And then below that, they have 3 billion people globally without access to broadband. And it says they're on the bottom left. In total, the satellite connectivity market could approach $100 billion annually over the medium term. And they also go on to talk about how hypersonic flight will be skyrocketing into the future as well. If you're not sure what that is, imagine spaceships flying from massive launch pad areas, not traditional airports, that would take you from New York City to Japan in 
like two to three hours rather than like 16 or 18 hours. They would fly much higher than the airplanes of today, but not quite, you know, like outer space kind of thing. Uh, but this is the potential of hypersonic flight, and it's clearly only going to be palatable for the hyper rich in its early phases. Check it out here. They have kind of a quick breakdown showing that they expect the demand for hypersonic flight to skyrocket. And it says on the bottom left, if 2.7 million passengers were to pay $100,000 for long haul hypersonic flights, the market would scale to $270 billion in revenues annually. And so we know that's all very like far off. That's very lofty, but that's kind of like the mode you need to be in if you're thinking about investing in ArcX. But it's clear Arc is excited about the future, and I think spaces like this show us a bit more about where players like Boeing or Airbus or like Lockheed uh, and some of the other aerospace plays come in. Um, it's pretty safe to assume that, you guessed it, SpaceX will need to be a big part of this equation as well going into the future. And that's really the rub for me with this fund. That's why I can't get super pumped up about it yet. There's lots of stuff to be excited about, and we're seeing basically the world of StarCraft become reality before our eyes through a lot of what's happening, primarily in SpaceX, and hopefully soon in companies like Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin and Richard Branson's uh, Virgin Galactic. Um, but the problem is that SpaceX hasn't gone public yet. It's a private company, and ARC isn't able to invest in private companies. There have been murmurs of SpaceX potentially going public in some point in the future, but we've seen that a few times in the past. Elon Musk has been like, like so frustrated at not only the demands of shareholders and the frequent drama of the stock market and various stockholders as well, but also the transparency requirements that go along with being a public company. As far as I've heard, it doesn't look like anything concretely is on the calendar for SpaceX being interested or needing to go public. And they've already managed to grab a quarter of the launch revenues in the market in 2018 with two of the $8 billion um, in the market available. We're also starting to see SpaceX's Starlink, which offers satellite powered internet, start to come online with particularly um, effective offerings for those on the move like ambulances or for those who live in remote locations in North America or also in other parts around the world. Um, starting to offer really good speeds and excellent pricing too. So when you think about all that SpaceX is doing and the bright future that it portrays, it's really hard to get excited about space exploration and innovation without SpaceX. It's kind of like if I told you you could have a bag of pizza potatoes, but only I get to eat the chips. Kind of. Man, these are good and I can't stop eating them, but I have to finish filming this video. But you guys get the bag. <laughs> I really want to learn more about the selection of companies in this portfolio, but it's pretty clear that even though I'm always ringing on about investing for the long term, dollar cost averaging, you're going to have to have like a really, really long term perspective uh, before you see much traction with this ETF. I think with all the different potential on the horizon, it could be like the biggest thing ever in the future. But I think also at the same time, you're probably going to have to wait like many, many years, especially while SpaceX is off there like conquering the galaxy, basically. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on some of the other ARC holdings, uh, please feel free to click up here on this playlist. I've been spending a lot of time making videos on Palantir and their potential, but I've also covered various other stocks in there as well. So what do you guys think about Arc X? Is it exciting to you? Is it too drab? Is it too bland? Was the lack of price drama on launch day like a turnoff for you? What do you guys think? I'm really interested to hear your thoughts or how this might fit into your portfolio, or if it's just kind of like a no-go for you right now. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you guys very much for your time. Love you and talk to you soon.